plastic. It's in almost everything. Food is stored in it. People drink from it. Work with it. Play with it. Less well known is that there is a chemical contained in many plastics that is also found in 93% of us. It's called bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is actually the chemical used to make polycarbonate plastic. It's the hard, clear plastic used in baby bottles. And it also is the lining of all metal cans made in the United States. Beer cans, soda cans, food cans. And this chemical leaches out of all of these products into any kind of food or beverages that come in contact with it. Bisphenol A, BPA, is what is known as an endocrine disruptor. Studies have shown that in lab animals it causes breast and testicular cancer, diabetes, and hyperactivity. Its effects on humans are not entirely known. The manufacturers of BPA and their lobbyists say it is safe. U.S. regulators agree. One team of investigative journalists decided to ask why. You call me when you're done. <coughs> Suzanne Rust is a science reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. When I was a graduate student, I read this article in the New Yorker. The, the theory was that there were chemicals in the environment that were um, somehow uh, messing with the reproductive system. And then I got into journalism, and suddenly these, these uh, science stories kept coming across my desk. The, uh, managing editor of my paper was really excited about one of the stories I had written. It was on this chemical bisphenol A. And he was like, are you interested in this? And I said, yeah. I went to Suzanne and said, we know breast, prostate, and other forms of these cancers related to the endocrine system are on the rise in humans. We know this stuff causes it in lab animals. We've got to look into this. Mark Ketches had just been hired by the paper as the new project's editor. We called him in. Um, and he got excited about it as well. Well, I think the central question that we came up with from the get-go was, why isn't anything being done to address the issue? So we set our sights on the regulatory efforts, uh, what the EPA had been doing. Uh, turns out, not much. Endocrine disruptors were first identified as the cause of wildlife abnormalities in the early 90s. The Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration, though, repeatedly reassured the public that BPA, at least, was safe. The agencies cited studies done in the 1980s. But prompted by an outcry from advocacy groups, President Bill Clinton signed the Food Quality Protection Act in 1996. That same year, the Safe Drinking Water Act was amended. The combined legislation promised a chemical screening program of endocrine disruptors to be overseen by the EPA. The goal was to determine whether or not they were dangerous to human beings. 1998, the EPA, headed by Carol Browner, sets a deadline to fast-track the testing of 15,000 chemicals suspected as endocrine disruptors. 1999, the EPA misses the deadline. The Natural Resources Defense Council sues the agency to enforce screening. 2001, a new administration takes office. Christine Todd Whitman becomes head of the EPA. 2003, two more suits are brought against the EPA, one by a coalition of environmentalists and advocacy groups, the other by the attorneys general of four states. The suits attempt to force the agency into compliance with the Food Quality Protection Act. 2007, 11 years after the laws were passed, the EPA had yet to screen its first chemical. Mark Catches assigned two members of what the paper calls its watchdog team to join Suzanne Rust in exploring why. Carrie Spivak and Meg Kissinger. You can go as, you know, walk into any grocery store or go to any makeup counter and, you know, you'll find plenty of products that contain chemicals that are suspected, and that's the big word, you know, they're suspected of, of uh, health concerns. And the mainstream media just hasn't paid that much attention to it. 
the journal Sentinel began to give some attention to the Environmental Protection Agency in June of 2007. At first, they were very cooperative, but when we said, look, Congress passed a law saying you're supposed to be screening these chemicals, and you keep pointing out that you're working on it, but now it's 2000, at the time 2007, you have yet to screen a chemical. And they realized that we were really pushing them and demanding answers. They got much more difficult to deal with. Stephen Johnson is the head of the EPA. The paper would report he declined repeated requests for an interview. And we're the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. We're not the Washington Post or the New York Times. So when you start calling officials from the EPA, you're not going to get the same kind of attention that, that those newspapers will get. So we had to be really persistent. There was a period of time where they just said, we've answered all your questions. Uh, we said, we don't care if you think you answered all our questions. We just kept going. Uh, and even on basic things, they were very difficult to deal with. The reporters eventually learned that the EPA, though it hadn't tested a single one of the 15,000 chemicals promised, had already spent some $80 million on the endocrine disruptor program. And here's tens of millions of dollars of tax dollars being spent and not a single chemical has ever been tested to this day. So the more they dug, the more they found. The team also learned that only in 2008 did the agency plan to screen its first chemicals, just 73 of them and not including BPA. And they wouldn't even be finished with that until 2010. That took literally weeks to get answers from them to give us the date of 2010. Elaine Francis, the National Program Director of the agency's Endocrine Disruptors Research Program, told the paper, clearly we would have liked to have been a lot further along, but science tends to move at its own pace. But the pace of science was far from the only issue. The reporters wanted to know just what was the science saying. The journalists found two camps, each with its own view of the science of bisphenol A. One includes Dr. Frederick Vomsal. In our test system with human breast cancer cells, what we found with bisphenol A was very different than what happens with the natural hormone produced in your ovaries. Vamsal is a biologist at the University of Missouri. He has studied bisphenol A for more than a decade. In 1997, a team of researchers led by Vamsal published a peer-reviewed study showing that when BPA was introduced to human breast cancer cells, it penetrated the cells and made them grow rapidly. And as a result of that, we got interested that maybe this chemical was a lot more potent than anybody had previously thought. And so we did a study where we administered it to mice and found that at a dose 25,000 times below what anybody had ever tested, we caused damage to the entire developing male reproductive system. Chemical companies who make or have made bisphenol A say that people have little or nothing to fear from what are known as endocrine disruptors. The chemical company's uh, basic answer was there's no known direct effect uh, that these chemicals are harming anybody. The paper heard the same from the industry's powerful trade and lobbying association, the American Chemistry Council. The ACC's Marty Durbin said science supports our side. An industry consultant and former EPA regulator, James Lamb, agreed, saying, I'm very comfortable with my kids and grandkids using these products because I believe the industry has done the studies that need to be done and that they're interpreting them properly. In defense of the safety of bisphenol A, the companies and the ACC cited studies they funded themselves, some paid for by the ACC, which has an annual $75 million budget. They say the reason they get these, these results is that their studies are better than any of the academic studies, any of the government studies. They can use more animals, they have better controls in their laboratory. But one EPA biologist, L. Earl Gray Jr., charged the industry with flooding the EPA with studies. David Rosner, professor of history and public health at Columbia University, explained why, telling the paper chemical makers have learned that if you play on the uncertainty of danger, you're going to be able to stop regulatory action. What you have is you have these studies will come out, 
and they have to weigh that against the academic studies or other studies that are questioning it. And if nothing else, the more you give the EPA additional studies, the more time it's eating up. The more time it's eating up, the more you're selling your product. You've won. The ACC's Marty Durbin denied that industry tries to stall the EPA's work. The paper posted this interview with him on its website. If it was our interest to delay things around here, we could just sit on our hands and see whether or not EPA gets any funding. But we actually, year after year, go up to the Congress using our resources and lobby to have essential funding to the EPA for these particular research programs. So again, I, I think our, our record speaks for itself. We've been fully supportive of moving this process along. Again and again, the reporters heard two different stories. One example, they found a statement on an ACC-sponsored website. It said that a person would have to ingest over 500 pounds of canned food every day to be at risk from BPA found in the containers. Other scientists told the reporters that even at very low doses, BPA and similar chemicals can affect lab animals. The concern is that they might harm human beings, too. It surprised me, too, how much rancor there was about this chemical. I mean, you would talk to some scientists, and, um, you know, they would tell you that the sky was falling. Um, you would talk to others, and they would tell you that it was fine, and then the, the, in, in the same sort of breath, they would cut the first scientist down personally. I mean, it was just it was kind of amazing. You know, I felt like I'd walked into sort of a geeky chemistry war zone. After three months of reporting, Rust, Kissinger, and Spivak pulled together the information they had culled about the debate over endocrine disruptors. And I remember we had a couple of stories sketched out, and we were pretty happy with them. And it was really basically saying there's all these chemicals out there, government's not testing them as they promised they would, uh, a lot of other countries are much more diligent about this, and then here's kind of a lot of the infighting. So we turn these stories in, and we're all excited and kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a wrap. And not at all. Uh, we called into Mark Ketches' office and basically got our fannies handed to us on a platter. <laughs> and he just said, you know, you know you're not there yet. So uh, we were crushed. The story was at an impasse. The editors wanted more work, more investigation, more examination of the science. We realized that, that the story would have a lot more authority if we went back and looked at all of the studies that had been done and really tried to conclusively show, is this a problem or is it not? Before she had become a journalist, Suzanne Rust had been a graduate student in biological anthropology. I'm not intimidated by scientific studies, right? I'm not afraid to read a method section. I'm not afraid to read a results section. I had enough um, sort of background in endocrinology where I was fairly familiar with the terms they were using. Rust left graduate school in 2002, just a thesis short of her PhD. I had done all my preliminary research. I had passed my you know, oral exams, my prelims. I was uh, married at that time. And then my husband uh, got cancer um, and died six months later. And that, that, was, um, that was very difficult. Um, and I, I, I sort of lost motivation at that point, was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and my advisor had always liked the way I had written grant proposals. And she suggested I take a writing class. So I did. The light shone, you know, it was like bells were ringing. I mean, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I love writing about news. I love writing about science. Um, and that was that. Now, as the reporters regrouped, the Journal Sentinel would call on Rust's experience with scientific methodology, asking her to dig much deeper into the story. So Mark was like, well, why don't we just do our own analysis? And so we turned to Suzanne and said, do you think you could do this analysis? Yeah, she thought she could. To begin her research, Rust headed back to school, to the UW-Madison Library, where she had done her graduate work. I searched for bisphenol A, looking for those criteria, which I had initially set out for myself, which were live laboratory animals with spines. Where were the authors 
um, what, what institutes did they work for, who funded the study, what the author's conclusions about the chemical were, how many animals they used to come up with these conclusions. Rust also turned to another public source of medical and scientific studies of bisphenol A, done by both industry and academic scientists. I, I went to PubMed, which is a database on, online that sort of puts together all stu- medical and scientific studies. And I put together a huge database with all of this information. In all, Rust evaluated 258 studies done over two decades involving lab animals with spines, the type scientists consider most relevant to human beings. Right away, you could see that 80% of these studies all found that this chemical caused harm. More than half the studies, 168 of them, evaluated bisphenol A at low doses. The vast majority of those, 132 of the 168, showed harm to lab animals. And Rust would report, nearly three-fourths of the studies that found the chemical had no harmful effects were funded by industry. Rust's overall conclusion, an overwhelming majority of the studies found BPA to be harmful in lab animals, causing breast and testicular cancer, diabetes, hyperactivity, obesity, low sperm counts, miscarriage, and other reproductive failures. Studies paid for by the chemical industry were much less likely to find damaging effects or disease. That's where this story took on uh, a whole different dynamic because you were able to show conclusively through that analysis of all those studies uh, that hundreds of researchers across the world had found problems with bisphenol A and yet nobody done anything and, and, and only a few studies had found that it was safe and most of those studies were funded by the chemical industry themselves. And, and that's when you knew you had something really, really special to tell to readers. All of the studies Rust had evaluated were in the public domain, as available to government regulators as they were to a reporter in Milwaukee. As the reporters were working on their story, they knew the government was continuing to look into bisphenol A. They would report on one panel funded in part by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. It consisted of experts who directly studied the chemical. That panel found in 2007, quote, great cause for concern about BPA. Meanwhile, the National Toxicology Program, the NTP, was in the process of coming up with its own brief on bisphenol A. Part of the Department of Health and Human Services, the NTP evaluates chemicals and other agents of public health concern. In 2007, the NTP convened a panel composed of scientists who didn't directly study BPA, but would evaluate the work of those who did. Among the panel's conclusions, while for pregnant women, fetuses, and children, there is some concern about neural and behavioral effects, there is minimal concern for prostate effects, potential accelerated puberty. There is negligible concern for birth defects and malformation. For adults, the concern was essentially negligible. In light of her own findings, Suzanne Rust wondered how the panel had arrived at those conclusions. We pulled out every single study looked at um, in their review of the bisphenol A studies. And so we just wrote down what the study was, who funded it, was it government industry, and then more specific, what government agency funded it, what industry in, um, funded it, what kind of animal did they look at, what was the strain, what were the doses used. Among the paper's findings, some of the studies the NTP panel considered were chosen by a consultant with links to firms that made bisphenol A. The panel rejected academic studies that found BPA harmful, citing inadequate methods, but accepted industry-funded studies using the same methods to conclude the chemical does not pose risks. It also accepted two studies finding no harm, funded by former BPA maker General Electric. They were done some 30 years ago. Neither was peer-reviewed. I try not to be too cynical, but I don't trust that. I, I would rather have an independent entity testing the stuff to know versus the guy that's making it. And the panel didn't accept any studies that found BPA harmful at low doses. Why? 
The paper reported the panel's chairman, Robert Chapin, said that once the panel weeded out studies it believed had been done poorly, no studies remained that showed effects from low doses. Chapin is a toxicologist who has worked in both government and industry. He defended the panel's work, saying that it had accepted studies that followed good lab practices and were backed with strong data, regardless of where they originated. He told the paper, we didn't flip and care who does the study. In November 2007, the reporters rolled out a two-part series entitled Chemical Fallout. Among its conclusions, the government's contention that BPA is safe is based on outdated, incomplete government studies and research heavily funded by the chemical industry. And we said why this is important to you. Why you should care about what's in the containers holding your food or other products and that this is all over the place and that there are legitimate scientific questions over the safety. We saw immediate reaction in Milwaukee in the marketplace. As soon as mothers read this, they stopped buying baby bottles that had this plastic and they had to go order a bunch of baby bottles made of glass and uh, BPA-free plastic. We have not gotten a, a single demand for retraction, no clarification request from the chemical industry. They've had nothing that they could come back to us on. That doesn't mean the industry has stopped defending bisphenol A. In answer to a question in an online chat the paper sponsored, ACC spokesperson Stephen Henches wrote, It is not correct that only industry studies support the safety of products made from bisphenol A. Government and scientific bodies with no stake in the matter have impartially reviewed all of the scientific evidence to reach their conclusions. The recent NTP panel evaluation is a good example. A lot of these plastic products people like. It makes life more convenient. The battles are going to become more intense as time goes on. You're having more studies come out, raising questions about it. We still don't have the answers to a lot of the questions, and we'll be continuing the investigation. This is Meg Kissinger calling with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. What started out as a regional paper's investigation about the failings of the EPA to regulate chemicals has exploded onto the national and international stage. I can't recall working on a story that had this much interest from this, this far away, this many folks. We get emails from all over the country. It was, it was a big surprise to us. The, the story just sort of took on a life of its own that we, we had never anticipated and soon you know, um, congressmen, senators were becoming involved, um, and we just realized it wasn't a story that could be dropped. So we decided we were going to continue looking at this basically until we had answers that made sense that we could explain to our readers what's going on here. What was going on was a lot of commotion around what was once a chemical most people had never heard of. On April 14, 2008, the National Toxicology Program, which advises both the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration, issued a preliminary brief on bisphenol A. It stated that the possibility that BPA may alter human development cannot be dismissed. That same week, the FDA's counterpart in Canada labeled the chemical a potential danger to human life or health, and proposed banning baby bottles containing it. So they looked at not just health studies, but they looked at environment studies, and they saw a concern not just for exposure to people, but exposure to waterways, to animals. There were similar proposals in the United States. California put forth legislation banning BPA and products used by children under three. State legislators would vote on the issue later in the summer. At the federal level, on April 29th, six U.S. senators introduced a bill to ban BPA from products aimed at children seven and under. 
and the House of Representatives would soon have a bill proposing the chemicals ban in food and drink containers. Representative Markey and uh, Senator Schumer from New York um, have both introduced legislation to ban the chemical. Michigan Congressman Bart Stupak felt the need for immediate action. He chairs the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. In May, he began calling for baby formula manufacturers to voluntarily change their packaging. There are basically four main manufacturers of infant formulas. And in the cans that they make, the BPA is lined in there. Well, our committee has been working with them, and we have them to agree that these manufacturers of the formula will stop putting the formula in cans or containers sealed with BPA. Now, having said that, our job is to keep their feet to the fire, hold them to the word, make sure they do it. Other corporations took their own initiative in either removing products containing BPA from their shelves or ending its use in manufacturing. In April, it was really with like almost breakneck speed. You had Walmart, Toys R Us, Nail Jean, you know, like a, like a bunch of dominoes. These companies stepped forward and said, we're going to get out of this. The marketplace can move faster than regulators can. So in our market, I think it's really hard to find a hard plastic baby bottle now. And as, as more people pick that up, that's going to change. Meanwhile, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, was completing its own study of bisphenol A. In August 2008, it released a draft of its findings. But the FDA said it is right now we don't believe people should be concerned. If people are concerned, they can try to avoid using this kind of plastic. But as a government, as a regulatory agency, they didn't see any concern for people. I, I absolutely can't figure out the FDA on this. Because how can they say that when their own advisory group, the National Toxicology Program, is saying that they have some concerns? Shortly after the FDA released its draft proclaiming BPA safety, California was to vote on its proposed state ban. And it was going to be a Monday vote. The Friday before that Monday vote, the FDA released its draft, um, which said that bisphenol A was not harmful. And it was a, my understanding was that the vote was already very close. And then when the FDA released this draft, it seemed to sort of just tip the scales. Discussion is ended. The clerk will open the roll. All members vote or desire to vote. 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 And the legislation failed. And it was only in the weeks after that that it was discovered that this FDA opinion was based on two studies. And guess what? Both of them were financed by the chemical industry. I'm amazed that the FDA relied on two studies when there's close to 200 studies out there. I wish they would have done the independent studies. At a public meeting, the paper reported, an FDA toxicologist explained why the agency dismissed hundreds of government and academic studies that the National Toxicology Program had used in evaluating BPA. Laura Twaroski said the studies were irrelevant because they were not designed to assess the safety of BPA. And she reiterated, the paper said, that the agency felt confident people were not at risk from the chemical. But as they kept investigating, the reporters kept finding the fingerprints of the chemical industry. On the FDA's website, they found documentation showing that portions of the FDA's draft were actually taken nearly verbatim from a review on BPA produced by the American Plastics Council, an arm of the American Chemistry Council. Uh, nobody knew that the um, chemical industry and its lobbyists were writing the FDA recommendations for them. Um, so it just, it's, the, it's a classic case of the fox uh, running the hen house. I really too, truly believe that industry just has too much influence over at the FDA, and that's the voice that's always whispering in the FDA's ear. With so much criticism in the air, the FDA would turn to an advisory board to review its own work on BPA. When we found out that the FDA was putting together this advisory uh, board, um, we knew they were going to have a meeting in Washington, D.C., and as any diligent reporter, I decided to go and background check all the people on the board. And the first person I did was Martin Filbert, 
Filbert was chosen to chair the FDA's Science Board Subcommittee on BPA. Filbert is also the interim director of the University of Michigan's Risk Science Center, which researches public health hazards. And one of its main donors is Charles Gelman. And then click, 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 you know, checking um, what newspaper articles have been filed on him. We come to find out that Gelman has um, fought regulation, government regulation on chemicals for years, and he's a fierce anti-regulation guy. The Journal Sentinel would report that Charles Gelman, a retired medical supplies manufacturer, was once labeled the second worst polluter in Michigan by the state's Department of Natural Resources. Gelman himself told the Journal Sentinel that BPA was perfectly safe and that concerns about the chemical were exaggerated by, quote, mothers groups and others who don't know the science. Here he was giving $5 million to the Risk Science Center that Dr. Filbert was the acting head of, um, and it seemed a little concerning to me that the FDA was then taking Dr. Filbert to be the head of their own advisory committee. Suzanne had emailed Filbert then, and he said emphatically, no, he's never discussed this. He's never had a conversation with Gelman about this thing away. Well, I got a phone call. Gelman called me back, and he says he's had several conversations uh, with Martin Filbert about bisphenol A, and he's very clear that he feels that bisphenol A is nothing to be concerned about. And he did go on to say that, you know, Filbert did not want to discuss this, so he had to ultimately cut off his conversations with him. Gelman made that $5 million donation to the center Filbert headed, an amount the paper reported nearly 25 times larger than the center's annual budget. The same month, Filbert was appointed to the FDA's subcommittee on BPA. The paper would report that Filbert didn't disclose the donation on an FDA conflict of interest statement. Suzanne and I go to Washington, and we interview the FDA, and, and we ask the FDA about this, and it was news to them. They didn't know anything about uh, Filbert's connection to Gelman. On October 12, 2008, the Journal Sentinel published the details of the Gelman donation. It was the beginning of three dramatic weeks in the pages of the paper and in the national battle over BPA. The FDA's Associate Commissioner for Science, Norris Alderson, told the paper there was no conflict of interest because, quote, Filbert's salary is not paid by the donation. They said they, they really truly believed there wasn't a conflict here. They were going to keep Filbert as the um, head of the Scientific Advisory Board on bisphenol A. Filbert said there was no conflict. He wasn't concerned about his partiality on the board. The story was picked up pretty widely. There was a New York Times editorial, a Washington Post editorial. The Washington Post ran our story. Filbert himself wrote an opinion piece for the journal Sentinel stating, Our aim is to protect and preserve the public's health. That task has been made harder by this attempt to impugn my reputation over a gift that does not benefit me directly in any way. The paper reported that an inspector from the Department of Health and Human Services cleared Filbert of conflict of interest charges. The inspector did recommend that Filbert refrain from voting on the questions before the board relating to BPA. Filbert did abstain, and in its report, his subcommittee did not take industry's side. It found the FDA's margins of safety in its draft on BPA inadequate. And, the paper wrote, the subcommittee recommended that the agency abandon its earlier findings about the safety of the controversial chemical. Well, the FDA, to justify their findings before Congress, said, well, we'll have our science review board look at it to make sure we did everything right. Well, the science review board said, you did everything wrong. So the FDA knew that, and they basically said, yeah, we'll look at this again. Well, when will they look at it? When will they do something? When will they put out a standard that's reasonable based upon modern science and technology? Who knows? The same week the FDA's science board released its draft, the agency's counterpart in Canada announced it would begin drafting regulations to ban the importation, sale, and advertising of baby bottles containing BPA. Canada took a, a much, uh, much broader view of the chemical, and with all the evidence combined, they said, this stuff isn't good to have in people or the environment, and let's regulate it. Meanwhile in the U.S., 
the journal Sentinel has reported that evidence that the chemical poses a danger is mounting. You know, up until now, the studies have all involved animals. And just this fall, two studies came out that were involving human health. And they raised quite a lot of eyebrows. Um, and and that, the first of which was to link bisphenol A to heart disease and diabetes. And um, that was substantial and significant. And the second of which uh, was published around that same time that showed that this phenol A is interfering with chemotherapy for breast cancer patients. And so that has caught a lot of people's attention as well. The American Chemistry Council disputes the two studies, saying they have significant limitations and that they merely claim false associations that add little to and even confuse the body of science. In Washington, the fight over BPA regulation has only begun. The Senate and House legislation that was proposed in 2008 never came to a vote. But Representative Bart Stupak believes that both houses will reintroduce bills this year. Uh, our committee will continue to try to push uh, for more answers and get the EPA and the FDA to do their job. It's exciting to think that uh, people are paying attention to this. What had been a very obscure story is really now seeming to catch fire. And so in our own little way here in Milwaukee, you know, I think we are beating the drum and people are starting to, you know, get hip to the idea that this bisphenol A stuff is worth taking a long look at.